Okay, the last thing we're going to take a look at in week three are what are called comprehensions, starting with list comprehensions, and then we'll also see that you can do set and dict comprehensions as well. So far, if we've wanted to create a list with some values in it, the simplest way for us to do that is to give a variable name to refer to the list and then an assignment operator followed by square brackets and the values in the list. So here on slide 46, we just have a V1 referring to a list of the squares of the first five integer values. 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25. OK, well, that's fine if our list is really short and if we know the specific values that we want to put in the list. But what if we needed to have the squares of the first thousand integer values? Well, we could do something like this. We could say, let's just start with an empty list. Here, V2 is referring to our empty list. And we'll use a loop to build up this list for n in range of 1,000. Ah, no. I just, ah, no, this is fine. I, I was going to say I've made a mistake because this range only goes up to 999. In particular, this range goes from 0 up to and including 999. But that's OK. We can, to v2, append n plus 1 squared. And so. Our range goes from 0 to 999, but our squares are going to go from 1 squared to 1,000 squared. And it just takes a moment for that to complete. And sure enough, we have this very long output of 1,000 squares. OK. Now, the idea of a comprehension basically is to put the for loop inside of the square brackets instead of after the square brackets, if you will. So in this case, I'm going to create v3 as a list comprehension n plus 1 squared will be the expression that specifies what value each item from the list should be, or in this new list should be. And then my loop is going to specify the range of values that n will be set to. OK, so we have square brackets surrounding the comprehension. The first thing that we do in the comprehension is to specify the expression that is supposed to be evaluated for each item that's going to be in my list. And then following that, we're required to have a for loop that presumably will specify the number of values and in some way the values of the values of these expressions. All right, so the number of values that we're going to have in this comprehension is 1,000. Specifically, they go from 0 up to 9999. And for each particular item, we're going to use the current value of n from the uh, from the for loop to compute the particular item value that we want. All right, so that's just a long way of... Now, what did I do wrong here? Ah, I must have... Ah, I see. I hit a square bracket by accident before I hit the enter key. I think that nevertheless created v3, okay. Yes. And rather than trying to display v3, I'm going to just show that v2 and v3 are equal to each other in terms of values. Now, that does not mean that v2 and v3 are the same object. v2 is v3 is false. All right. Here's another example in which we're using a string as an iterable for our for loop rather than the range. v4 is going to be. The expression value here for each item in v4 is just going to be c for c in some string. Pythonic. 
Okay, so comprehensions are considered to be the Pythonic way of creating things like lists and sets and dictionaries, which, as I said before, means that it's cool. And it's also a mechanism that Python provides that other languages don't necessarily provide in as convenient a way. So again, the idea here is that we're going to loop through this string, Pythonic exclamation mark. C is going to take on the value of each one character substring one at a time. And that value is then going to be used as an item value within V4. So V4 now contains a list of all of the one character wide strings from the string iterable Pythonic. You have to have a for loop in order for something to qualify as a comprehension. So for a list comprehension, the general form looks like square brackets containing some expression which specifies how each item within the constructed list is to be computed. Then we have some for loop stepping through the values in some iterable. Now, you'll notice here that we say vers rather than ver because the iterable itself might be an iterable on tuples or an iterable on lists or an iterable on sets or something. And you can use multiple assignment to create multiple variables corresponding to the individual items within that, let's say, list of two tuples or list of three tuples or whatever you're stepping through. Optionally, you're also allowed to have more for loops or if decisions to specify nested loops for the expression values to be computed or to specify in the case of an if decision whether the expression should be created at all. Let's take a look at some examples of these. Here we have a really simple example. My expression is 7. So regardless of how many items there are in my iterable and regardless of what those values are, every single time I get a value from my iterable, the expression that's going to be put into the list that I'm creating is just 7. For i in range 5. So range 5 is my iterable. i is going to take on these values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And for each one of those values, the expression is going to be 7. So all this does is to create a list of 5 items with value 7. I can create a list of Booleans. Here I'm saying n less than 2 as my expression. So for each possible value of n, where n is going to be my loop variable, if the value is less than 2, I'll have a true value in my list, otherwise false. So for n, pardon me, n in range 5. All right, well, 0 and 1 are less than 2, so I should get true for the first two items and false for the remaining three items. And indeed, that's what I get. In this next example, we have a loop through a string, a bit like the Pythonic example that we just saw on the preceding page. But this time, we are appending an optional if following that loop. So we're going to get the value of a character that is a, a one character wide string for C in the string hello. But only if the value of the current one character wide string is not a lowercase l. All right, so I have five one character wide strings in hello, H-E-L-L-O. And for each one of those values, we're first going to check whether that value is not L. If that value is not L, then that's going to become one of the items in my list. But if the value is L, 
that value is going to be ignored. Consequently, my list is HEO, and the two L's are not included in the resulting list. In this fourth example, my expression is a simple computation, K over 2. I'm going for J in range 5. So J is going to take on the values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But notice that the expression k over 2 does not involve j. Instead, what we have here are nested loops where k, the variable the expression uses, is taken from an iterable consisting of a range from 0 up to but not including whatever j currently is. All right, so the first time through the first for loop, j is going to have the value of 0. And that's going to control the second loop, which controls the value of k. So the second loop here, the inner loop, is going to set k for the values in the range from 0 up to but not including 0. Aha. Well, so a loop going from 0 up to but not including 0 does not do anything. The loop terminates before anything occurs. So for the first value of j in the first loop, the outer loop, where j is 0, the inner loop does not do anything. We go back to the second value of j, which is 1, and that now controls what happens in the inner loop. So k goes in range from 0 up to but not including 1. All right, well, 0 up to but not including 1 is the single value 0. So that value for k, which is 0, is used to compute the first item in our resulting list, 0 over 2, which is going to be 0, 0.0. Division always yields a float. OK, and the inner loop now uh, is finished because k only loops on 0, 0 up to but not including 1. The third time through the loop on j, j is going to have a value of 2. And in the inner loop, we're going to set k to range from 0 up to but not including 2. Consequently, k is going to take on a value 0 first, which will give us this 0. And then k will take on a value 1 next, which will give us 0.5, 1 over 2. And that's the end of that inner loop on k, going from 0 up to but not including 2. The fourth time through the loop on j, j will take on the value 3. And so k will go from 0 up to but not including 3. That is, k will take on the values 0, 1, and 2. And from there, we compute these next three items. 0, 1 half, and 1. The final time through the outer loop, j will have a value of 4. k will loop from 0 up to but not including 4. And that will give us these four final values, 0, 0.5, 1, and 1.5. OK, so the bottom line here is that a comprehension can involve nested loops. And the iterable on the inner loop can depend on the current value of the outer loop's loop variable. So these comprehensions can be quite compact and quite flexible. OK, so we confirm that this comprehension actually does what's shown on slide 49. Now, not only can the for loop part be relatively intricate, for example, using a for loop with an if, or using an outer for loop with a nested inner for loop, but the expression itself can also be arbitrarily complicated. And here on slide 50, we're showing a comprehension in which the expression part is itself a comprehension. All right, so notice that we're creating a list comprehension here using an expression followed by this red for loop. That's contained within the black square brackets. But the expression 
in blue is itself a list comprehension in which we're computing an expression i plus j with a for loop for i in range 4. So what we have here is a list comprehension using this red for loop that's going to create a list of four items for j going from 0, 1, 2, 3. But each item within that list of four items is a list of four items in blue with i going in the range 0, 1, 2, 3. All right, so here in the result that I have vv1 as a reference to this result, the outer square brackets correspond to the black square brackets for the outer level comprehension. And then each of the items within that outer level comprehension is itself a list of four items. Okay, so let's see why we get these particular values that we get. Well, so the red for loop is controlling the overall construction of this list. And j is taking on the values 0, 1, 2, 3, one at a time. The first value for j is 0. And with j set to 0, we evaluate the blue expression. In the blue expression, what we have is a list comprehension. The item value within that list comprehension is going to be i plus j for i going from 0 up to but not including 4. Okay, so j's value is 0. i's first value is 0. So 0 plus 0 is the first item value in the first list within the list being created by j. Okay, so we get a 0 plus 0 is a 0. Then j is still equal to 0. i's value becomes 1. And 1 plus 0 is a 1. The third time through the blue for loop, i's value is a 2. 2 plus 0 is a 2. And the final time, 3 plus 0 is a 3. We are now done creating the first item, which is a list, in this outer list of items. So we're ready to go on to the next value of j, which is going to be 1. And that allows us to build this next item, which is itself a list of values, 0 plus 1, 1 plus 1, 2 plus 1, 3 plus 1. So that gives us a list, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then the third time through, j's value is 2. And so for the third item, we get this list, 2, 3, 4, 5. And finally, for the fourth item, we get this list, 3, 4, 5, 6. So what we're creating here is a list of lists by using a list comprehension for each item inside the outer list comprehension. And I'm just going to type this in to confirm that it does what I claim more space available to me in my idle shell. So I'll just go ahead and type the whole thing on one line. And VV1 is indeed a list of lists. On slide 51, we're doing another list comprehension. But this time, we're creating a list of tuples rather than a list of lists. Notice that I'm using parentheses here to create a tuple for each item in this list being generated from the red for loop on j. Okay, so j again here is going from 0 up to 3. And the first tuple is going to be integer powers of 0, 0 to the 1, 0 to the 2, and so on. Then the next tuple is going to be integer powers of 1, which are all 1. And then integer powers of 2. 2, 4, 8, 16, and finally of 3, 3, 9, 27, and 81. VT1 sub 3 is going to be the fourth. The sub 3 tuple is the last tuple in this list of tuples. And the sub 2 item in there is this item 27. 
So again, let me go ahead and type that in to confirm that it really does what I claim. And I can type it all on one line. OK, so there is our list of tuples. VT1 sub 3 is the sub 3 that is the final tuple in that list of tuples. And VT1 sub 3 sub 2 is the sub 2 that is the third item within that tuple within that list of tuples. Well, so we've made it through list comprehensions. A list comprehension, as we've seen, consists of an item that's computed for each value in some iterable. So the list comprehension requires you to specify an expression to be evaluated for each item and a for loop over some iterable specifying how those list items are supposed to be computed. Optionally, that for loop may have an if decision. Optionally, that for loop may have another for loop, creating nested for loops, or in fact, some sequence of those. You can have a for loop followed by an if, followed by another for loop, and another if, and another if, and et cetera, et cetera. The expression itself may be arbitrarily complicated. The expression itself may be a list comprehension, or maybe a tuple, or maybe a set, or maybe whatever. Now, to create a set comprehension, you do exactly the same thing that you would do for list comprehension, except for two changes. First of all, we use curly braces around the set comprehension rather than square brackets as we used for a list. Secondly, we have to be careful that each item that we want to put into our set is hashable. So we could not create a set of lists or a set of dictionaries or a set of sets. But we can create sets of ints or strings or floats or sets of frozen sets if we wanted. Here we have an example where S1 is being created using a set comprehension. Each item in the set is going to be the value of this expression C. And our for loop is going to set the variable c one by one to the values in this iterable, hello world, but only if c is not in aeiou. That is, only if c is not a lowercase vowel. Okay, A string is a kind of collection. We can use in or not in to check whether something is in or not in a collection. And so we're going to end up with the set S1 containing all of the values in Hello World, only one time each, except for the lowercase vowels. And what I end up with is L, D, H, R, space, comma, and W. Only one copy of each of those. And in the final example here on slide 52, we're showing the idea of trying to create a set comprehension where the items are lists. And if we try to do this, we're going to get yelled at because lists are not hashable. It's also possible to create a dict comprehension. Really, the only thing different here between a list or set comprehension and a dict comprehension is the form of the expression. You do have to use curly braces to create a dict comprehension. What differentiates that from a set is that the form of the expression needs to be a key and then a colon and a value. The key has to be hashable. The value can be anything that you like. So here, my for loop is the int values 5 up to but not including 10. And the items that I'm putting into my dict are the value of n as the key with a list containing the square and cube of that value as the values associated with that key. So the key 5 is associated with the list of values 25 and 125, the key 6 with 36 and 216, etc. 
If you attempt to create a tuple comprehension using parentheses, you don't actually get a tuple. What you get is something called a generator. A generator is a kind of iterable that will produce for you the values of the expression part ahead of the for loop part. So it's almost like a potential comprehension, but you can use the generator in any context where you could use any other kind of iterable. So if I say g1 gets the expression c for c in hello in parentheses, g1 is this generator object. If I want an actual tuple, we know that I can use the tuple conversion function with an iterable, and I can use my generator object as an iterable. And so now I have the tuple containing hello. OK, so that gets us to the conclusion of week three. We have talked about set objects, how to create them, compare them, how to access and modify and delete items within a set. We saw that in a set, all of the elements have to be hashable. You can generate unions of two sets, intersections of two sets, and so forth using either symbolic or named functions. A set is iterable, mutable, and a collection. That is, you can loop through it. You can add or remove or change values in it. You can determine whether something is in the set or not in the set. But a set is not a sequence, which means that you can't ask for things like slices or do individual subscripting. We also looked at dicts, in which all of the items are key value pairs. The keys have to be hashable. There's no restriction at all on the values. The values can be anything. Like a set, a dictionary is iterable, mutable, a collection you can detect whether a particular key is in or not in a dictionary. And likewise, a dictionary is not a sequence. You can create a dictionary from any iterable on pairs of values. In the documentation, this is described as an iterable on two tuples. So something like a list of two tuples would be the most obvious thing. But actually, it only needs to be an iterable on pairs. So you could have a set of strings that are two characters long. And we illustrated that. And the idea is that of the two characters in the string, the first character would be used as the key. And the second character would be used as the value associated with that key. You can generate iterators on pairs using the zip function or the enumerate function. Then we looked at construction of all these collection data types using the named constructor functions, list, tuple, set, and dict. These construction functions take iterables as arguments. And finally, we looked at comprehensions. You can create list, set, and dict comprehensions, a comprehension always has a for loop preceded by some expression. And the value of that expression is what determines the value of each item in the list or set or dict that you're constructing. Optionally, following the required for loop, you may have additional for loops or if decisions or some combination of those. There's not directly such a thing as a tuple comprehension. If you attempt to create a tuple comprehension by putting the notation for a comprehension in parentheses, what you get instead is this thing called a generator, which can then be used as an iterable for whatever purpose you like. Alrighty, so that gets us to the end of week three.